was we're trying to solve grand challenges here, right? Clean energy, net zero climate emissions. These are big interdisciplinary things that involve, by definition, a multitude of different stakeholders with different interests. We need all of our brain power combined to find a solution. The energy transition was always going to produce some form of tension. That isn't altogether negative. Friction keeps the speeding train on the tracks, after all. In the energy industry, it's electric utilities and clean energy developers who most often collide. One positioned as the gatekeeper of the grid and the other a disruptor. Plenty of challenges face the energy transition, but one underpins nearly all of them, interconnection. Utilities and developers, meanwhile, are beginning to recognize the importance of collaboration and that fences must be mended to reach our goals. I'm John Ingle, Editor-in-Chief of Renewable Energy World and Power Grid International. This week on Factor This, I'm joined by Kerry Gill, the Head of Electric Regulatory Strategy of Rhode Island Energy, and Ed Brolin, the Vice President of Policy and Distributed Government Relations at RWE. Both will be featured speakers at the Interconnection event Grid Tech Connect Forum Northeast, which will be held in Newport, Rhode Island in October. Gill and Brolin break down the challenges and solutions to interconnection in the Northeast and preview what you can expect at Grid Tech Connect. Register today using the promo code PODCAST to receive 10% off admission. That's all next on Factor This from Renewable Energy World. Kerry Gill and Ed Brolin, thanks so much for joining the Factor This podcast. It's great to see you both. Great to be here. Thanks. Thanks for having us, John. Of course. And really looking forward to taking a deep dive into this conversation about electrification, clean energy, and interconnection in the Northeast as we prepare for the second edition of Grid Tech Connect Forum Northeast, which will be in Newport, Rhode Island in October. And I think the first time I met both of you was the October prior at our first edition of Grid Tech Connect Forum. So you guys are some some veterans and um, really looking forward to getting both sides of the the conversation here from the utility perspective, also that of the yeah, developer independent power producer. Um, the gist of Grid Tech is you know, bringing together all these groups that are critical to moving us forward when we know we don't always engage in the most uh, proactive and productive ways. I think we can all concede that at, at, at some points. First, um, before we get too far down the road here, I would love for you each to introduce yourselves and give a little background on your um, your career journey and your current roles so that the audience can get to know you a little bit better. Carrie, could you get us started? Yeah, absolutely. So right now I lead electric regulatory strategy for Rhode Island Energy. Uh, we serve about 97% of customers in the state of Rhode Island. We provide both electric and gas distribution service. Um, before that, I was with the Rhode Island Office of Energy Resources, which is our state's energy policy office. Uh, was there for five years working on all things clean energy and climate policy. My background is in environmental economics and business, and I've also spent time working on uh, lots of other renewable energies, so solar thermal, offshore wind, <laughs> energy efficiency, um, a little bit of everything, but now I'm with the utility. Awesome. Well, Kerry, thanks for being here. And Ed, I, I will briefly introduce you myself. You are known in many of these interconnection circles and are uh, privy to a lot of the proceedings. And when I was initially putting this event together, when it was just kind of a, a thought in the back of my brain, um, Ed Brolin came up in many of the conversations that I was having throughout the industry on the on the developer front. And I would say that's good and bad for you, Ed. You don't want to be that <laughs> well regarded and or notorious at the same time. But how about you share a bit about yourself, too? Great. Thanks, John. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, so I've been in energy for over 20 years, but I spent the first 15 years of that actually in the energy services sector, primarily with Constellation Energy, one of the largest third party suppliers, which was also an Exelon company. So I have good grounding in the utility space and the competitive supply space, but jumped to renewables about five years ago. And from day one have been up to my eyeballs on interconnection issues because it's only the most important thing, right? It's uh, absolutely critical that we get this right. We have a lot of challenges, but we also have a lot of of opportunities. So I am active nationwide, uh, both in the various states, uh, particularly community solar states, because those are the ones where things are really coming to a head most critically, but then also at the federal level, helping to work with the Department of Energy's CETO office on their I2X exchange. And uh, really love having these conversations, really love the conversations we had last year at Grid Tech Connect, and I'm very excited for this year's uh, version of it. And uh, just looking forward to chatting about these important issues, because 
They are the most important things. And Ed, frame a bit RWE's position in the market too, because obviously multinational, um, you know, energy company uh, vertically integrated here in the United States, a lot of M&A in the last couple of years. I, I believe, were you guys involved in the Con Ed um, renewables uh, portfolio purchase? Walk me through kind of where you guys stand in the markets you're playing in. Sure. Yeah. So RWE is the third largest solar developer in North America. We also have substantial presence in the offshore wind, largest leaseholder for offshore wind and onshore wind. Uh, we did come over as part of that transaction when uh, the clean energy businesses were sold to RWE by Con Ed Holdings. And our group is focused more on the distribution space, the community solar type driven things, but not just exclusively that. So a lot of synergies because there was an already existing utility scale focus in the policy team here at RWE Clean Energy. Uh, but we are focusing on supporting what we call our distributed clean energy team that does things not transmission connected, but rather distribution connected. Well, and we're not specifically talking about offshore wind in this conversation, but maybe you two can sidebar about that uh, <laughs> after the fact. So for those who are listening who don't know, Grid Tech Connect Forum, which we've been talking about, is designed to bring together kind of three critical stakeholder groups, developers, utilities, and regulators in this unique way to address specifically interconnection in a, in a regional environment. So um, at the October event, focused on the Northeast, primarily New York and New England, and, and trying to make sure that we create a venue for these niche conversations to happen and to not have to talk about ERCOT in the same breath as ISO New England and, and uh, alongside KISO. And we all celebrate what KISO is doing and everyone else gets uh, maybe left behind or, or uh, not given that that limelight. So from the very beginning, it, the, the focus has been on collaboration and relationships. So really interested to hear from you, Carrie, from the utility uh, perspective, we always hear about how the siloing of our industry kind of holds it back and that we stay in our corners and maybe at times get territorial or defensive about, you know, our roles and the, the, the roles of those external stakeholders. How critical do you think it is to bring together those outside groups um, and, and engage in, in more of a transparent and open way? Like what, how does that contribute to what you do on the utility side? Absolutely. Collaboration is 100% necessary. Um, listen, we're trying to solve grand challenges here, right? Clean energy, net zero climate emissions. These are big interdisciplinary things that involve by definition, a multitude of different stakeholders with different interests. We need all of our brain power combined to find a solution. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges that we're facing uh, with the clean energy transition and with interconnection is affordability. Um, so from the utility side, obviously, we have customers calling saying they can't pay their bills. Uh, we have customers who, uh, you know, we offer um, bill payment plans, we offer budget plans, we offer discounts. Uh, but this is front of mind for, you know, your average neighbor or family member. Um, and and so, so that really has to be front of mind for us. Um, I'm going to give you just two examples, and, and I'll try to highlight how collaboration plays into both of them. So first, we're coming out of, what, three decades, basically, of uh, a paradigm in which we were seeing very little load growth and only minor penetration of distributed energy resources and electrified end uses like heating and transportation. We are facing three decades, and I would argue we're right in the beginning of three decades, of immense dynamic change where we're going to be increasing the amount of electricity that has to flow through the grid at any given time. And the reliability of that electricity is paramount, right? If we lose electricity in this new paradigm over the next three decades as we decarbonize, that means we can't work from home. Our kids can't do their homework at home. We run the risk of not having heating in the winter or cooling in the summer. We run the risk of not being able to evacuate from a storm if our cars aren't charged, right? So, so the way that we think about our electric grid has to change to meet this new paradigm. We have to consider reliability as a public health necessity. We have to consider affordability uh, as a, a, a basic tenant of what we're doing. We're not going to be able to get there unless we work together. And so what does that look like in practice? Um, instead of just building bigger, instead of reacting to a one-sided decision about let's build X, Y, and Z here or there, 
we need to be at the table together. We need to have advanced foresight of what's going to come down the pipeline, whether it's renewable energy interconnection or load interconnection. Um, that way we can plan smarter. We can use our grid smarter and more efficiently. That's going to put downward cost pressures on electric rates. And that's ultimately going to get us to have price signals that encourage electrification, that encourage renewable energy deployment, and that encourage ultimately the decarbonization that we're looking to get to uh, statewide, nationwide. Excellent. And Ed, interested to hear how you come at this too, because just by the way that our market is set up, it often pits the utility and the developer against each other. You're trying to break the door down so you can get interconnection. Utility saying, I need to make sure it's safe and reliable and doesn't shift costs onto other customers. And, and then there's this friction in the middle that just, I think, naturally leads to some animosity. But you both experienced grid tech before. So you've both been in this environment where you're not just engaging with your, you know, intersector peers, like at a, a giant trade show that's just focused on what you do. For us, it's distribute tech with utilities, say RE plus with developers. How, how do you see this shaking out in, in practice, Ed, this, this topic of collaboration and, and why it needs to happen or, and if it's happening? Yeah, well, I think it's fits and starts, and that's that that makes sense. I mean, listen, we have utility business models and regulatory paradigms that grew up over a century to support an old world where we had large centralized power generation sending power unidirectionally down to load. So all of the things that developed over those decades made sense for that paradigm. We're now trying to do a completely different paradigm, and, and, and I'll echo all the thoughts that Carrie just expressed. Frankly, I don't think you need me on this podcast. She's covering them uh, as well as I could, but, you know, she was, we, we, she we... was one of our keynote speakers last year, so, I mean, the, the I do remember are a little that. tip. No, I'm just kidding. Ed, you are, you are uh, very well regarded in your own right, so continue, but... No, but I mean, we really do need to listen. I, I always say, is this an energy transformation or isn't it? And if you're transforming something, what you have to do is critically examine all of the elements of that thing and make a determination as to whether or not it is going to be compatible with the new paradigm you're trying to create, whether it needs to be tweaked or whether it needs to be consigned to the dustbin of history. Right. So we have to look at everything in a critical way. But going back to the original question, John, I mean, how is collaboration happening or is it happening? Uh, it's starting. It is difficult. But I think that we are recognizing on our side as well as on the utilities side that it's only by rowing in the same direction that we're going to be able to get to where we need to go. And I'm really excited about the innovation that's happening in the Northeast, which we can talk about at the conference uh, and, and in this discussion. You know, we saw the first of its kind in Massachusetts when DPU did 20. 75 and they had multi-beneficiary cost sharing for the first time rather than just the interconnecting facilities bearing the costs of system upgrades. We now have the electric sector modernization plan uh, going on in Massachusetts, the CGPP in New York, the Peace Up in New Jersey, all these proactive distribution system planning processes which we've never done before. So it's a little bit daunting and we're going to have to figure out how that's going to work. Uh, this, this podcast may get a little stale because I think it's on Thursday of this week that we're getting the orders out of DPU on the ESNP uh, proceeding. But we are heavily engaged here at RWE Clean Energy and through our trade associations and the industry at large with our utility partners trying to come up with what the solutions are going to look like to get us to this fundamentally different paradigm, which none of the none of the processes and business practices that we've had previously contemplated or are capable of handling. I appreciate that. And I would agree with the fits and starts um, characterization. I, I've reported a couple of times that I feel like in pockets, there are utilities that are starting to shake this kind of infallibility that they've had for years that, you know, we are the institution, uh, can do no wrong. We, we know how to keep the lights on. We, we know the best way to approach these different issues and are now starting to open the door in more um, expanded ways and different opportunities to say industry and public see what we're thinking, weigh in, and at, at times will change direction. And I think that's an important signal too to the market that these proceedings aren't just um, – you know, uh, part of the process and not actually playing any role um, because it, it can feel like that at times, I think. Um, I, so I want to get into what needs to change. You guys both talked about this shifting paradigm and the need for market reforms and, and changes to how we approach this challenge since it's very unique and not the same as 100 years ago when we actually built this grid. Um, that 
sentiment is shared frequently. I don't know that the changes have followed despite the pickup of that rhetoric. And in the preview podcast that we did with one of your regulators last year, Carrie Gill, um, Abigail Anthony, the commissioner from Rhode Island, she mentioned how difficult grid modernization is, how tough it is to figure this stuff out. Utilities say we've got this big electrification and decarbonization challenge. Here are the investments we would go make. Well, you have to prove that you need it now, that it's not going to be obsolete in five years, that there's going to be customer benefits. Balancing all that with the safety, affordability, reliability um, tenants that utilities have always been guided by seems seems really difficult given the, the stakes. Kerry, how do you guys think about that internally at at Rhode Island Energy, how, how do you navigate all of these state policy goals, knowing that um, if you put out these lofty investments uh, that that aren't you know clearly pinned to data, you're going to get burned? Yeah, uh, that's a really great question. That's definitely one of the challenges that that we're working to to resolve. Um, you're absolutely right. There are challenges associated with getting cost recovery from some of these larger investments. Um, but what our research is showing is that even though these investments might be more costly initially, they provide long-term benefits to be able to use the grid more efficiently, to be able to interconnect quicker, to be able to actually run a network whereby we communicate with our distributed energy resources, as opposed to having it be a one-way street of communication and then reaction on part of the utility and operating the the electric grid. Um, I, I'd also like to say this has to go beyond investments, right? Grid modernization is one piece of the puzzle, but as Ed, Ed was saying, our entire paradigm of processes too was built around this idea of a few centralized gener generators with radial power flow out to customers. And so I think that it's time and, and you know, to, to get to your point, John, how do we actually enact this collaboration in instead of just saying it's important? It's time for us to look at our processes. How can we bring utilities, developers and other stakeholders to the table in a way that helps us meaningfully understand the other's interests, where they're willing to go, um, what investments they're willing to make and sort of, you know, allow us to visualize this really complex Venn diagram to see where that piece in the center is. We have to look at our processes too, and that's something that is relatively little investment cost, but that can make a really big difference down the road. Yeah, and I'll just say, you know, I appreciate all the, the points that Carrie made. You know, one of the other aspects of this is what are utilities allowed to do? or what are the regulators allowed to do, right? So I pointed earlier to DPU 2075 as bleeding edge as it relates to multi-beneficiary cost sharing. The only reason that the Department of Public Utilities in Massachusetts was able to promulgate that order was the roadmap bill that got passed the year prior. Because prior to the roadmap bill, the mandate for the Department of Public Utilities was safety, reliability, and just and reasonable rates, full stop. And if that's your mandate as a regulator and somebody comes to you with a proposal that falls outside of those priorities, it's difficult, if not impossible, for you to give the green light for that. So in the roadmap bill, the legislature actually expanded it to say that DPU also has to consider the Commonwealth's decarbonization goals and environmental justice principles. And it's by giving them that more latitude and authority that we've been able to see some of the regulatory you know, innovation that we've seen in Massachusetts. In our view, we need to get all of the stakeholders to understand the constraints under which the utilities are operating and the regulators are operating. And again, figure out how we can all begin rowing in the same direction in this new world. It's a softball question that comes up in probably every uh, panel discussion, the low hanging fruits. And, and I think, Ed, you were you were kind of getting there, even though there's quite a bit of depth to 2075. So I'm not going to, to brush it off like that. Um, but but what are some of the low hanging fruits, in your opinions, um, uh, opportunities for collaboration or those procedural changes that we could tackle, carry to make incremental change happen? And I, I ask that every time I moderate a panel, too, because I think it's helpful to give the audience something to leave with of, you know, here's the call to make when you get back in your car or hop on the train or get on, you know, send the email on the plane. Does anything pop into your mind as like, we could be doing this now, we just aren't? I've got two things I'd love to offer, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so so first, um, I think one low hanging fruit, at least for us in Rhode Island, is to be more clear and comprehensive about how we treat energy storage. Uh, the commission uh, a couple years ago actually finished up a really insightful report on uh, the state of energy storage incentive programs and regulation in Rhode Island. And they offered two recommendations for uh, an energy storage services tariff and a more clear energy storage interconnection tariff. Uh, they were spot on with that. Let's be more clear so that we're at least all working from the same language, as opposed to trying to decipher uh, what the different parties are saying or what the different parties are trying to do. We can just set the stage with clarity right from the start. Um, the second thing that I would offer is, um, you know, I spoke a little bit about how our electric power grid is going from this, this one way sort of reactionary uh, state to a very two-dimensional, multi-dimensional, uh, complex network where we're constantly bal balancing uh, sending and receiving electricity from not just a few centralized generators, but from hundreds and thousands of generators um, uh, 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 over, over the jurisdiction. I think another low-hanging fruit would be to really work through setting up a partnership that allows us to manage away the extremes as opposed to manage to the extremes. To coin a phrase that uh, my colleague Ryan Constable, who has also <laughs> spoken at Grid Tech a number of times, uh, uh, says all the time, um, let's work together, right? Things we don't have to build out. We can just trust each other. We can trust our systems in place. We can trust our software. We can trust our hardware. Let's work together to get to a more efficient uh, system of generation and delivery. She's got my vote. Ed, <laughs> what, what do you think? It, again, I, I was like, it, oh, this is this is a, a stump speech. I've heard this before. Yeah, no, amen to all of the above. You know, John, to the question you say, what's the call to action? I'll, I'll say uh, with a terrible pun, perhaps a clarion call for the people in my industry to be more mindful of where their expertise lies and doesn't lie. And likewise with the utilities and bringing in the other stakeholders. And really the, the, the clarion call I would give is for people to show up and people to, to, to listen and to talk and to engage and to do the hard work. Um, you know, oftentimes when we've talked about sort of distribution system planning, uh, a perhaps unsurprising uh, reaction from the utility is, okay, well, we'll do that. We'll figure it out and we'll let you know. Um, or, you know, it's like, you know, maybe pat us on the head and say, thank you for your interest in our affairs. Let's figure out where we can put the solar. It's like, guys, the developer community knows how to figure out where the solar can actually go. What you're expert at is figuring out what's best from the distribution system. And oh, by the way, there are other stakeholders who also have maps of their own in the environmental community and in the municipalities and everyone. And hard as it is and unprecedented as it is, I believe that we need to have as big tent a conversation as possible and have everybody showing up in good faith, willing to listen as well as talk and engage. And I think that that's the, the genius of the Grid Tech event. We are bringing people together. Like you say, it's not just me talking to all my developer friends at RE+. Uh, you know, it is, it's a conversation. Those damn utilities. Uh, <laughs> they got, they got it's a conversation. Yeah, it's a conversation we've got to have across all of the different stakeholder groups and, and, and interests. Um, there's going to be a lot of need, Carrie. You correctly point out we're at the start of a couple of decades of what we had back many, many decades ago, which is unprecedented growth. So there's going to be many opportunities for the utilities to have success and contribute to that. There's also a need for private capital to invest in this energy transition. So there's going to be a lot of opportunities for private companies and developers to come in and have success as well. We've just got to stop doing this and really start pulling in the same direction. That's great. And, and the initial value proposition behind Grid Tech, and when I was sharing it with developers who are kind of more of a new audience for us, that utilities are our sweet spot, and we, you know, Distribute Tech's been that major player for decades, was that in the interconnection equation, oftentimes it's a, an unnamed inbox, like interconnection at, I'll use Rhode Island Energy, for example, RIE.com -E or Eversource.com or whatever. And you'll get a reply every so often with the document you need. It's unsigned. There's, there's no signature. There's no name. That kind of black box relationship, I don't think, uh, benefits the, the point on, you know, being more collaborative and getting to know each other and having that professionalism and, and acknowledgement that there are smart developers, there are smart utility engineers, and smart people getting together is usually a good thing. 
And so that that was the initial pitch was you knowing who is behind interconnection at nationalgrid.com is is, an, you know, worth the price of admission. Um, I, I'm interested what you guys think about that kind of informal engagement. So outside of the public proceeding, ca can much be accomplished in those environments? Like what what advantage is there to rubbing elbows, Ed, with someone on the utility side that you know you're going to engage with a grid in New York or um, Eversource in Connecticut or, or Rhode Island Energy um, a, a little down the road? Yeah, no, John, I think that's a great point. The humanization of this stuff is really so critical to create the conditions for collaboration. I'll say, obviously, you have, you know, proceedings that are very formal. One of the things that we found to be super valuable in the various jurisdictions that have actually uh, instituted it is regular monthly interconnection working groups, whether that's yeah. the IPWG and ITWG in New York or what have you. Now, some of them are more effective than others, and there are factors as to why they can be more or less so. But at the end of the day, it's that regular coming together. And and those discussions and the understanding of, oh, I remember John said this three months ago, and I've been thinking about that, and now I'm incorporating that into a proposal that I'm making. I think it's really critical, and events such as Grid Tech are great for that, but also just in your various states, having those regular conversations with not an interconnection inbox, but a human being, uh, I think is really critical. But Carrie, interested to get your perspective on that. Um, it, as soon as you said humanization, you got me. That's exactly what it is. At the end of the day, we're all people. We take pride in our works. So we want the same thing. We're on the same team. We see the same vision for 2050. Um, where we might disagree is how do we get there? Maybe this way someone thinks is better. Maybe uh, someone has wants to prioritize this or that interest over here. That's fine. Disagreement is not personal. You need to stress test any solution to make sure that it's a viable solution. That works for everyone. And this kind of informal engagement at Grid Tech allows us to stress test those ideas in a very safe, very informal environment with the most creative, innovative thinkers who, again, are all just your neighbors, your family, your friends, your colleagues. We all want the same thing. We're all on the same team. So this allows us to come together and, and learn from each other. Yeah, we're not being callous either. I mean, the stakes are high. The safety, reliability, equity, all these things, they're, they're very important and you have to be very careful. And as those kind of institutions, I think utilities, um, that, that's part of the influence around, you know, you move too slow or you take too long to approve a, a project or adopt a new tech technology. I, I think that's the exciting thing about these kinds of uh, forums and summits is to your point, Carrie, to be able to stress test that and, and see what the market thinks and send those signals even even informally um that hey we're looking at this and bring bring a good idea to us and we'll we'll start thinking about it i think um there are a lot of advantages there ed brolin carrie gill thanks so much for joining me and i'll see you in newport in just uh, a couple of months okay hey, thanks john thanks, looking john. forward to it Thanks again to Carrie Gill and Ed Brolin for joining the podcast. Factor This is a production of Renewable Energy World and Clarion Energy. Join us every Monday as we break down the clean energy industry's biggest issues with industry leaders who actually move the needle. And please leave us a rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time on Factor This from Renewable Energy World.